Welcome back. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green, and this will be an introductory uh, overview about um, uh, for my students who are reading Shakespeare's The Tempest. It is also going to be a lot of background on colonialism because we will be reading Aimé Césaire's um, A Tempest or Un Tempet uh, in French. Um, uh, after, directly after we read uh, Shakespeare's The Tempest. And so filling in on some of the colonialism stuff is going to help. I also highly suggest uh, this short um, book, it's really just a long essay, uh, Discourses on Colonialism by Aimé Césaire. Um, this was produced in 1955. Um, and uh, his kind of adaptation rewriting of The, of the Tempest named A Tempest um, was written in the late 60s. Um, so uh, Césaire's work will show up um, throughout some of the stuff, but there's of course been a lot more um, recent work on colonialism um, in the past 50 or 60 years since since he was writing. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the overview first. Um, I'm going to continue my um, analysis using the term Euro-Christian, so that will be present, it's been present in um, earlier um, analyses of Richard II, of Hamlet, um, and of A Midsummer Night's Dream um, this summer of 2021 as I am making these lectures or contextualized readings. So let's jump in here. Um, my my goal is to, to both cover the play but also to talk about Shakespeare criticism to a certain extent and um, to talk about the politics of teaching Shakespeare, which many of my students I know are aspiring teachers, and um, this is stuff that we need to think about if we are going to be teaching Shakespeare, especially in contexts where we don't necessarily get to choose to, cho to um, whether or not we um, teach Shakespeare, right? That Which I think is the case for many people who become high school teachers. Um, uh, uh, so it's the politics of what happens at universities versus high schools, curriculum, how that relates to demographics of where you live. There's a whole bunch of complexities that will go in here as well. Um, uh, so The Tempest, I'm going to be using um, the really um, the brand new Broadview edition. So this is the one I'm using. It's got nice, nice context um, for my students, um, but of course any version of The Tempest will do uh, for these, these readings. Um, so we know that it's written um, and performed um, between 1610 and 1611. The first per performance appears to be November 1st of 1611, um, so quite late in the year. There are various different um, sources, um, but I, I put that in quotes there because um, uh, this is one of the plays that it appears that Shakespeare has made up his own plot rather than drawing directly on some ancient sources or ancient preformed fl pl plots. And I've said this throughout my contextualized readings that Shakespeare is someone who is of an era where using older things um, uh, was useful to him as a writer and um, because his audience would already be familiar with them. So it wasn't about originality in the way that we might think of it or prize originality in the 21st century. Um, not so much about individuality either, and some really nice recent work on Shakespeare, um, such as Kevin Curran's book, um, uh, which is over here. Um, Shakespeare's Legal Ecologies, for example, um, does a nice job of challenging the kinds of individualist ways that we tend to, 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 to overread individualism into Shakespeare. Um, so some a couple of the sources here, uh, some people will say that Montaigne's um, On Cannibals uh, appears to be a source. Um, it definitely shows up in the, um, in the play, but not till later acts. So I don't want you to confuse at the outset this character Caliban, whose name appears to be an anagram for cannibal, right? Um, with um, the, with Montaigne as a source, um, because I think that what uh, it's pretty clear that what happens with the character of Caliban is not really what Montaigne's talking about in that essay. 
Um, so, uh, um, the word cannibal was around, um, Montaigne's essays were, uh, published in English in 1603. I think that they were in French in 15, around 1580, but that's, I'm going from the top of my head there. Um, and, uh, um, the word cannibal first appears in Othello, which was written around 1603. And the line in, from Othello is, and of the cannibals that each, um, that, that eat each other eat, um, the anthropophagi and the men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. Um, so that's a reference to monsters called the Blemmies. You can look that up, B-L-E-M-M-Y-S. Um, you can even on Wikipedia or something, you can get pictures, all sorts of crazy drawings of, of, of uh, fantastical monsters, creatures that exist in these newfound or faraway lands and people who mean who in Europe or England would have known any better, right? So um, uh, these are fantasies of the human imagination. A lot of cannibalism is fantasies of human imagination. Um, the word cannibal is um, uh, a derivation of the word carib or cannib. Um, and so it does come from the Caribbean. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively recent word that shows up um, in the, uh, about in the, the mid-1500s, um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the first times that it's showing up in English. So uh, um, a very recent word, um, ancient concepts around barbarism, of course, attach themselves to um, the ways that the Europeans are encountering uh, native folks in the Caribbean. Um, the other source for the play is going to be um, from a little pamphlet called The Sea Venture, and this is why we know that the play is dated um, as late as it is, um, besides the fact of the, the date of the performance. Um, but the date of the writing um, uh, happens after this shipwreck. So the story of a ship called The Sea Venture was, um, uh, which went missing on its way to Jamestown, um, uh, which is in current day Virginia, Remember, this is not the first English attempt at a settlement. The first actually happens um, and is a failed attempt that happens in the 1580s and while well, Elizabeth is queen. But Jamestown, obviously named after King James I, right, uh, ends in 1609. Um, Jamestown is founded in 1608, I believe. Um, so there's a ship called the Sea Venture that was carrying over 150 people um, and it wrecked in the Bermudas. People in England thought it lost for a year, so when word spread in autumn of 1610 that there were survivors, it was big news and seemed miraculous. The news was reported in a pamphlet called um, the, A True Repertory of the Rack, and I just called it the Sea Venture earlier, but yeah, that, the, the name of the pamphlet is A True Repertory of the Rack by William Strachey, who'd been a passenger on the ship. But that pamphlet wasn't actually published um, until around 1625. Before then, it was circulating in manuscript form, and that manuscript appears to be one of Shakespeare's sources. So that's pretty interesting that um, in this play, current events seem to be really inspirational for Shakespeare. So late in his career, he's doing something um, rather new, which isn't to say that like that the 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 War of the Poets, as we talked about in um, Hamlet, wasn't a current thing that was influencing the way that he talked about Hamlet as well. But it's such a um, a, a, a necessary source for the plot of the Tempest here. Um, at the same time, um, so many of the themes of the play appear to be um, so, uh, uh, Shakespeare returning to themes of the 1590s or returning to themes of his youth and early career. Um, a lot of reference ways to think about um, well, one important way, I think, to think about The Tempest is to think about it in relation to um, the Christopher Marlowe play, Dr. Faustus, for example. Um, uh, and, and Marlowe dies really early. He's a really big influence on Shakespeare. And there's definitely ways to be def reading, um, if you have time, um, Prospero, the character, in relationship to Faustus. Um, so Pros uh, Prospero is not, not at all... Uh, a unique character in some ways. He's a conglomerate as, or a composite as many of Shakespeare's characters are. Um, 
the lack of backstory um, uh, and necessary contextualizing makes the Tempest easier in some ways, I think, than, um, especially for high school students, I would say, than the histories. So we just did Richard II in the past few weeks, and there was tons and tons of historical contextualizing that I did. I'm going to do a lot of that for here, but I think one of the things about The Tempest that makes it so frequently taught is that it doesn't have that historical context. You don't need to know the, who was king, you know, a hundred years ago, um, and how Shakespeare's writing for Elizabeth or for James in that context. Um, uh, James, of course, is still king when the Tempest is being um, put on stage, but uh, uh, um, I think there's a double-edged sword there, right? But because we don't teach children, and especially in the United States, enough about colonialism itself, they tend to confront the racism and the white or Euro-Christian supremacy inherent in the play as something to be studied um, for the first time in college, even though many of my university students have experienced racism or white supremacy throughout their lives. So I'm not saying that you first know about it in college. It's just that the it's in, in the culture that we live in, because it's so influenced by liberal um, and secularist humanist values in our education system that are embedded that I'm trying to challenge a little bit here that deny and minimize colonialist legacies. Um, uh, we end up confronting all of this stuff as adults. And then, of, I mean, how many times have I taught Shakespeare or colonialism in classes? And, and it's the first time that students as adults are, are confronting issues of racism or their white privilege or whatever that um, um, uh, goes along with that. Um, or, or their, you know, um, you know anger at, or resentment of white privilege that hasn't been vocalized or expressed um, in any constructive way um, until we enter classrooms in the university. And so we end up doing a lot of emotional, um, almost therapeutic work in our classes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and so I, I highlight that because a lot of my students, as I said, want are aspiring teachers, and um, I'm going to give a lot of information on Euro-Christian colonialism here because it was the partly the subject of my second dissertation. So I've, I've done a lot of the work already, and also because I want to give those of you who do end up teaching Shakespeare. Um, for a high school class, some places, some some historical. Um, ways in to grounding some of the ways that we can think about colonialism um, and the way that it informs ongoing white, in quotes, or what a better term for me, Euro-Christian supremacy. So one thing that we have to resist from the outset is a, is a common way that The Tempest has been read. Um, so the conventional and historically unfounded treatment of The Tempest as Shakespeare's retirement play or his signing off of his career on the stage before leaving London um, is rampant throughout culture. Um, uh, and it's pretty easy, it's so apparent, it, it's, it's, it's so rampant that it's easy to read the play that way. Um, but Emma Smith at Oxford um, has some nice critiques of the play um, as it's been conventionally thought of as aligned with Shakespeare's life. So as she rightfully notes, writers in Shakespeare's time just simply did not produce autobiographies. So if we're reading a play like The Tempest as if it's Shakespeare's autobiography, um, we're already pre doing a lot of decontextualizing historically. Um, as Emma Smith notes, one of the first statues to Shakespeare, which was erected you know, a century or more af after his death, so not until the 1700s, um, was inscribed with words from the Tempest. And it appears that from that time, critics and publics have wanted to conflate the person of Shakespeare, who we don't really know that much about, with this play, which is indeed a late play in his career, but he dies, you know, five years later. Um, he does eventually leave London. Uh, there are other plays that he does work on after he leaves London, um, and uh, um, but the, but this is often taught as as the end of his career, or thought of that way. Um, uh, 
uh, um, it's also taught as a kind of, um, as Smith points out, as, as you know, a peak or an apex of his career. And I think that she brings up something really interesting that, that you know, we artists, like, um, we don't necessarily produce our, our best work in a kind of linear way. Um, lots of artists think of your favorite bands, for example, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, is, is the best thing that, that, that your favorite band putting out the, the, the newest record or was it, did they have this one record earlier on in their career, um, that, that was, that was particularly great. Um, uh, argue, uh, argue with a Beatles fan was Abbey Road the best record of their career or not I mean then you can have all sorts of debates uh, <clears throat> more historically accurate to Shakespeare's time Renaissance humanist rhetoric stressed being able to argue both sides of an issue with so much eloquence that the audience could not know the actual opinions of the writer um, and we know that Shakespeare is trained in that kind of humanist element, that post-Renaissance um, style. So by far, what we've seen throughout Shakespeare's plays throughout his career, this has been the case with Shakespeare in earlier plays that we've read, whether it's Midsummer Night's Dream or Hamlet, um, or uh, um, most recently for, for me as I'm making this video, Richard II. Um, but throughout his career, one of the geniuses, one of the most brilliant aspects, I think, of Shakespeare is that we don't know where he is in the plays, yet the plays themselves have the several recognizable features of his style. So we need to kind of push back on this kind of tendency to overread autobiography into a play. Critics um, around The Tempest have also debated whether or not or how much the play um, is dependent on or, or could the play have been written without this so-called discovery of America and critics have uh, I'll just say that the critics have have fought about that in the past Emma Smith at Oxford notes that um, everything in the play revolves around Prospero and that often for Shakespeare everything revolves around the main character other characters can seem rather two-dimensional um, in more recent critical times in the 20th century, um, uh, some critics and uh, stage directors have given it uh, the play psychoanalytic readings. This is unsurprising with uh, Freud and Hamlet and um, what I've covered earlier this summer. Um, they've suggested that it's all in Prospero's mind. Um, at least one stage production has um, staged the whole play just as Prospero mouthing everybody else's lines, um, so as it's it's all just about him. Um, uh, in other psychoanalytic readings, Prospero equals the ego, Ariel equals a super ego, and Caliban e equals a kind of id. So they're at three aspects of the same psyche. Um, uh, Prospero has been played as a loving father um, and a selfish and tyrannical overlord. Um, so that's, there's that flexibility in the play that leads, that's that classic Shakespeare flexibility that, that leads us to, um, interpret or stage it in so many different ways. Um, yet we know that from his own training, um, humanist, um, uh, in, in humanism, that that's part of, of what he's trained to do. Um, so again, pushing back against that tendency to read um, biography or to assume that he's writing autobiography with the play. Um, humanist readings often minimize the visions of colonial violence in the play um, because secular humanists r rely on and continue to benefit from colonial violence. Um, that's why those perspectives try to minimize it because they're embedded within, um, again, I will use in quotes, white, but more accurately, Euro-Christian supremacy. Um, I want to push against that in my readings of the plays. So, uh, as I'll say that again, humanist readings often minimize the visions of colonial violence that the play gives us access to by focusing on Christian values presented in secular humanist form tacitly in the play. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things that I mean is that 
there's not a lot of overt references to Christianity itself in The Tempest, but there's a lot of things, and many people have written articles and books about this, this very subject, there is a lot of Christianity embedded in the play, particularly through the notion of grace, through the notion of forgiveness, especially as we get towards the end of the play. I'll get into that more in my contextualized readings by act. But um, uh, uh, because the Christianity isn't overt, the play seems a little bit more secular. Of course, he's doing magic and all sorts of things. Uh, Prospero is doing magic and all sorts of things that would not be cool with uh, the Protestant Christian establishment in which he he um, lives, um, but we know that he's been dabbling in that since way back at A Midsummer Night's Dream in the 1590s, right? So, uh, in what follows in the rest of this um, general introduction, I'm going to shift over to colonialism itself, um, but I'm going to be pretty explicit about my intentions here. I'm going to continue my analysis with the analytic of Euro-Christian as a designation for a social movement to follow what one of my own now retired professors, um, his name is Tink Tinker, who's a Washage or Osage Nation here um, uh, in, in Colorado. Um, Osage Nation, of course, is, is further east than us. Uh, um, but one of the things that Tink Tinker taught throughout his career, which is that Christianity is colonialism and colonialism is Christianity. They both really signal the same sorts of things. It doesn't mean that there weren't earlier power struggles before Christianity. It's just how we know of colonialism, or what I call Euro-Christian colonialism. Uh, when we deny the history of colonialism as embedded with Christianity, when we deny that racism as we know it came from that cultural situation where you're of Euro-Christian supremacy, then we don't really see where racism as we know it today came from. Um, uh, so when we um, deny this history, we minimize the ongoing legacy and hold of white or um, of racist white supremacy or what I would call just Euro-Christian supremacy. That's end of my intro. That's where I'm going. Um, so let me jump into colonialism for those of you who've never studied it before. So colonialism is overtly apparent, apparent in The Tempest. That is very clear. The textual evidence shows it. They're on this island. They've got this overlord. They've got slaves, um, slave like well, two, two particular slaves here. And then there's all sorts of the, the normal sort of um, class relations that we see throughout Shakespeare's plays with the nobleman and um, uh, Trinculo, the the jester, um, the the intriguers in between. Um, uh, so uh, we need to look at colonialism to understand what's at stake. I think in the Tempest, um, and in order to see this, I'm going to take a particularly anti-colonial approach in the way that I present this information. I'll also read the play as an expression of Euro-Christian humanism. So political theological analyses are not far behind in my thinking here at, at, at all. So secular humanists want to minimize colonial violence by saying, but look at these other values. And I'm going to say, take those values, map them to Euro-Christianity as a social movement, and uh, they are one in the same thing. They're not. The secularist narrative is not is not any different than the colonial violence that um, underwrites its existence, um, and the 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 key political theological concept here, or you can just say theological concept, is going to be grace, the Christian notion of grace and forgiveness that is apparent at the end of this play. Uh, so this is an underlying theme throughout the Tempest itself, and it's one of the things that clearly situates it as Euro-Christian in terms of its ex expression as a social movement. Okay, continuing on with um, uh, um, colonialism here. So uh, the, the, the slave trade off the west coast of Africa begins in the mid-1400s, and quickly the European powers start um, uh, um, fighting each other over 
who gets to find slaves. Now the slaves are being taken from there because the slaves who were being taken earlier from place uh, from um, uh, Eastern Europe have been sort of cut off or um, uh, problems have arisen with the, the establishment of the Ottoman Empire, which has also blocked trade routes to China. Um, and so trade in general economies um, uh, are a, very much a part of this story, although that's not going to be the focus of my lecture here today. Um, uh, what's going on? So w what happens is the um, in order to get slaves to go fight, eventually what they want to do is, is to fight holy wars against um, uh, the Muslims. Um, and against the Ottoman Empire, the Christians in Europe start taking and justifying for themselves the taking of slaves from Africa. Um, the, what, we, what we end up with are papal bulls of donation. This is where the Pope gives other people the right to go take other lands and to take people from those lands, you know, right in quotation marks there. The first one, or an early one, there are, there are ways to trace this earlier, but I'm just going to go with the, the time period here, um, is 1452. It's one called um, um, Dum Diversus. Um, and then it is, the language gets um, repeated in Romanus Pontifex in 1454. And this language gets repeated and repeated and repeated in different seals and different papal bulls um, uh, for, for a long time afterwards. So I'm just highlighting language from one bull here. So this is the Pope writing to uh, the then King Alfonso, I believe, in Spain, or sorry, in, not in Spain, in Portugal. <laughs> and he says, we, the royal we of the Pope, we weighing all and sing singular the premises and due meditations and noting that since we had formerly by other letters of our ours granted among other things free and ample faculty to the aforesaid king alfonso so he's named quote to invade search out capture vanquish and subdue all saracens and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of christ wheresoever placed and the kingdoms dukedoms principalities dominions possessions and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors the kingdoms dukedoms counties principalities dominions possessions and goods and to convert them to his and their use and profit by having secured this faculty the said king alfonso and his or by his authority, the aforesaid infant justly and lawfully has acquired and possessed and doth possess these islands, lands, harbors, and seas, and they do of right belong and pertain to the said King Alfonso and his successors. That's from the papal bull Romanus Pontifex in 1454. The language gets repeated and updated slightly and intercetera, the first intercetera, which is 1456, that gets renewed again in 1481, and then it gets renamed and renewed under Alexander IV, Pope Alexander IV, in 1493. That one is significant. Why? Because it comes right after um, Columbus's voyages into the Caribbean and his initiation of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, uh, Closely related here is the Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494, which updates um, some of the earlier papal bulls by establishing a, long, um, a longitudinal line in the middle of the Atlantic um, that says uh, that Spain gets things on the west of the line and Portugal gets territories to the east. And because that line hits the tip of Brazil, that's why today Brazil is still Portuguese, and the western side of South America generally speaks Spanish, at least in their colonized forms. There are all sorts of indigenous peoples who live and speak other languages in those territories. Okay, so that's a lot to think about there. So what we want to think about is that this doctrine of discovery um, and the word discovery is loaded. 
all the time, even when we think about it scientifically, like, oh, I discovered something. It's part of a legal process, just like you would patent something if you came up with a new invention. That's what the Euro Christians are doing throughout this period. That's part of what colonialism is. Uh, the doctrine of discovery also evidences a coherent early examples of Euro-Christian deep framing. So it is not just ideology, it's deeply embedded in Euro-Christian worldviews. Um, and so this goes back several hundred years, I'm just going to be very brief about it um, in this intro here. Um, uh, but we should be contextualizing this doc doctrine of discovery within a longer Euro-Christian process. So as Robert Miller um, and his colleagues write, quote, scholars have traced the, the doctrine back as early as the fifth century um, current era when they argue that the Roman Catholic Church and various popes began establishing the idea of a worldwide papal jurisdiction that placed responsibility on the church to work for a universal Christian commonwealth. This papal responsibility, and especially the Crusades to recover the Holy Lands from 1096 to 1271, led to the idea of justified holy wars by the Christians to enforce the church's vision on of truth onto all peoples. Robert A. Williams Jr., in a really important book called The American Indian and Western Legal Thought, um, uh, uh, tells an anecdote um, while well, he's imagining the kind of mindset of this, this friar John of Plano of Carpini, who was sent um, as a pupil of Francis of Assisi and an emissary of the Pope. Um, of Pope Innocent IV to witness the 1246 coronation of Guvak Khan, who's a grandson to Genghis Khan, if you know anything about that. So this guy's sent to Asia, right, in the 1200s, um, uh, to, to witness this guy being crowned as emperor of the Mongols, the greatest empire that the world had ever known in that time. And the Pope basically sends this guy, Friar John, <laughs> with two letters, the first of which is to set out in detail to explain how St. Peter had set up Christ's church and left um, Pope Innocent in charge of it through succession of the admittance of all human souls to heaven. The second letter warned Khan against expanding his empire to Christendom, chastising him for ignoring the natural laws and warning of God's wrath. So as Williams puts it in his book, the aspiration to conquest and religious superiority are thoroughly present in the late medieval Pope's mind. That's why I'm going into this. It's already part of the culture before the so-called discovery of the so-called new world, right? Um, as is the ethnocentric concept of the West and appealing to its emergence system of international law. Williams argues that law, regarded by the West as its most respected and cherished instrument of civilization, was also the West's most vital and effective instrument of empire during its genocidal conquest and colonization of non-Western peoples of the so-called New World of the American Indians. So legal thought in general evidences the conceptual continuity of Euro-Christian deep framing. We see that, I will give a, a recent example of that, even applying to the United States um, at the end of my talk today. Um, so resonating with, um, with all of this that the scholars have said from before the so-called discovery of the new world, um, so resonating with Williams's legal history, um, there's a Christian theologian. So even Christian theologians, if you think that I'm being, you know, harsh on Christians here, even Christian theologians note this. So, uh, Christian theologian Willie James Jennings identifies what he calls the, um, the quote, Christian imagination, and his book is called The Christian Imagination. Um, he identifies an operation informing the outset of the African slave trade in the 1430s with a theological justification for Euro-Christian superiority and emergent notions of civilization built on a modern nostalgia for the Roman Empire. So the Europeans at this stage in history, what he's saying, they're looking back to the Roman Empire, 
and they're saying we need to build something that great and they had slaves and they did all of this stuff and we need to do that too um and so they're building it on an idea of their own past um uh um, so with respect to the next 500 years, so from the 1430s into the 1900s, right, uh, uh, Willie James Jennings says Christianity will, so he uses the, the future and present tense here, right, Christianity will assimilate this pattern of displacement, not just slave bodies, but displaced slave bodies will come to represent a natural state. From this position, they will be relocated into Christian identity. The backdrop of their existence will be, from this moment, the market. So what Jennings here is particularly describing the Euro-Christian attitude as central to constructions of modern notions of race and economy that inform the inequitable treatment of indigenous peoples as well. So partly there's the designation of slave, that makes them an outsider and then a reincorporation of the slave into society even a way of moving the slave as a slow converter or conversion to christianity that slavery is used not only to build christian empire but it is used as a force quote civilizing to convert indigenous people african people into in, in, into christians as well so and we will see this so think about that when you're like encountering this guy P caliban in the in the, in the slave of caliban in the play um uh and and also in comparison to ariel the other slave in the play um why is caliban treated the way he's treated but ariel's treated the way he's treated very quite different differently um so beyond law alone and beyond theology alone i've given examples from both um, Robert Williams traces aspirations of Christian universalism to the early church and to Paul's articulation of the Corpus Mysticum Christi, yet hierarchically directed by the Pope. This hierarchy, as mentioned by my previous chapter, has been analyzed by indigenous, um, oh, that, uh, that this was part of my, of my dissertation, so you don't have my previous chapter there. <laughs> if you want it, you can, you can ask me. But this hierarchy, um, has been analyzed by indigenous scholars such as Tink Tinker and Stephen Newcomb, um, who are signaling a Euro-Christian worldview distinctly different from the deep framing of indigenous peoples. Um, so especially before contact with the Europeans, but nevertheless intergenerationally present from colonial genocide. So there are many indigenous people today, American Indian folk or Native American folk today, who would, would, are trying to continue um, to perpetuate a worldview against ongoing colonialism. So colonialism is present for indigenous peoples. There's no such thing as post-colonial for indigenous peoples. It's just ongoing colonialism. When we don't think of it that way, we enable it to exist as if, it, as, as, as if it's been naturalized. It's all done. And so a lot of people have embedded racist ideas that sort of indigenous people live in the past or in an outside of time type of space um, or um, uh, that, that they're inevitably um, they were they were like one of the racist constructions is they were fierce warriors but they've been conquered and so we have statues that and that um, uh, embody that kind of racist notion um, forgetting the fact that indigenous people live today in community in our cities and on reservations still um, and practice um, world ways that correspond to a world view that is not Euro-Christian. Um, uh, so what changed according to the scholars between the fifth century of the Pope um, and then Pope Innocent in the middle in the medieval times um, uh, was an emergent and Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas is a great Christian theologian, um, uh, Aquinas inspired notion of humanism that allowed Pope Innocent to believe that infidels shared in a Eurocentrically understood universalized reason. And because they shared this universally human trait, the Pope could justify sending armies against pagans 
who erred in their thinking. So part of the justification for taking other people's lands was that they were indeed humans like the Europeans. They could, they had some kind of rationality, and because they had that rationality, they should be able to understand who the true God is. So reason, the way it, with a capital R, was used as a Euro-Christian hierarchical force. So when you say just be reasonable or look at all of the great things that Euro-Christian civilization brought to the rest of the world, which is a racist thing that people say quite often, um, what they're doing is they're foregrounding that idea of reason in a hierarchical up-down way and saying we brought this to you we civilized you and we converted you into our own scheme so it's basically like being asked to be pat on the back for genociding other people um, <clears throat> uh, um, so this point the Christian humanism that's emergent in Aquinas and it's, it's, it's fully expressing itself by the time of Shakespeare um, uh, this point is important because after contact with indigenous people in um, the so-called Americas uh, debates about their humanity arose um, prompting Spanish theologians of the Salamanca school such as Francisco de, uh, de Vitoria um, and um, Bartolome de las Casas to um, argue um, on behalf of the quote human rights of the indigenous peoples now that notion of human rights was already a euro christian notion right so we when we think about human rights that's it's already embedded at least in this period within christian notions now people will still debate today the notions of human rights um uh uh and, and my friend tink tinker who i've mentioned is actually going to be speaking at the Rothko Chapel in a few months on this idea of human rights and to, to what extent it's embedded in Christian theological notions. So that's an ongoing um, discussion to be had. Um, uh, if I return back to the middle of the 1500s to these debates, um, uh, as Robert Miller says, um, the argument that indigenous people were indeed human was loaded with respect to emergent international law. We think about international law, we think about human rights, we think about all of this stuff that's wrapped up in Euro-Christian colonialism. We need to unpack Euro-Christian colonialism in order to deal with issues of rights, inequities, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of those things that are so much a part of our current day discourse. Um, in a really great book called The Fall of Natural Man, Anthony Pagden gives a detailed account of um, these debates that happen in the 1500s. Um, and then he gives an account of Tom Thomist, or St. Thomas Aquinas, um, of his readings of Aristotle and a shift towards faculty psychology. Um, a shift towards that the, the, there are things that in our, in our brains that are called faculties that, are, that have to do with the ways that we categorize and think of the world. Pagden also covers the famous 15th century debates around Indians' humanity and the Val, um, Valladolid, uh, um, which is a city in Spain, controversy um, between Juan Gilnes de Sepulveda and Bartolome de las Casas, who followed Francisco de Vitoria's thought. Um, so, so de las Casas followed. Pretorius thought. What emerges from Pagden's uh, careful analysis is how in deciding that the, Indi that the Indians were indeed human, because some people were saying, well, we can subject the Indians to whatever they want because um, whatever we want because they're not human anyway. They're more like beasts and because they, they're like beasts, they can be treated as beasts of burden. Whereas the Franciscans were saying, no, from this Christian humanist perspective, they possess a degree of rationality that is was inspired by the creator by their god and because they have rationality they need to be converted into christianity so both are genocidal both ideas are genocidal towards indigenous peoples let's just one uh one is uh less per perhaps less overtly violent um than the other um uh but that let's i'm not at all meaning to paint de las casas as a hero here um uh 
But the Christian humanist version of it did say, oh, no, we should treat them nice and we should convert them by their own wills. Now, once they were converted, they could just be treated like slaves anyway, and then they would still die. It was just uh, more of a boon towards the Christians who had gained their souls and said that their souls had gone to heaven. Um, uh, uh, so um, Pagden's careful analysis, so I could return here to the text. Um, in deciding that the Indians were indeed human, um, the Euro-Christians had internalized a faculty psychology that moved Aristotle's descriptions of the natural slave mentality of the barbarian, which he wrote about in his politics, to the childlike mentality of those uncivilized men deemed rationally capable of natural religion, but in need of Christian domination for their salvation. Thus, we see that the conqueror mentality of the Euro-Christians was not only one of mere violent and subjugating force, but also one carefully refined through the tradition of Euro-Christian education that channeled that violence to serve its own ends. So people will say, well, slavery existed in ancient times. Racism exists. Well, racism ex has always existed. Racism has not always existed in the way that we understand race in the 21st century. That's a product of Euro-Christian colonialism. Skin color racism, for example, comes from that. Yes, in the ancient world, in Roman times, in ancient Greek times, there was slavery um, as well. But what the Euro-Christians do, and what I'm trying to get at here, is they, they, they are wrestling with the, they know that it's immoral to keep slaves, um, so they know that it's bad and they're trying to justify it and what they do to justify it is they look back to Aristotle who said oh some people are just naturally inferior and they deserve to be slaves the Euro Christians say well no actually like Indians have and there I'm using their terminology yeah I know the Indians are wrong word right Indians or have a degree of rationality, but they're not as rational as us European Christians. And so what happens is that, that because they're not as rational as us, but they are slightly rational, we can convert them, but they're more like children. And they might be able to grow up and be civilized, but it might take many generations. And so slavery or perpetual slavery, as the popes say in their papal bulls, is going to be this civilizing force. That's the justification for slavery, is that it is a tool to convert more souls to Christianity. Um, uh, so as Anthony Pagden says in his book, he says, the effect of Vittoria's arguments was to render the natural slave theory unacceptable while still retaining its original framework of Aristotle's psychology. The suggestion that the Indian was a child was not a novel one, this had been thought before. It echoed the unreflective opinions of countless colonists and missionaries who came, had come face to face with real Indians. By couching his argument in terms of Aristotle's bipartite psychology, he had a explained just what it had meant to be a child and by doing so he had opened up the way to an historical and evolutionary account of the Amerindian world and that's where you get this evolutionary um, linear historical trajectory that's being mapped by Euro-Christians onto um, what we now call the Americas. As Pagden notes, this evolutionary view would change again during the Romantic period after Hugo Grotius and Samuel Pufendorf developed theories of minimal morality um, and Adam Smith developed his four stages of development that would come into inform approaches of world religions in the 19th century and anthropology. That universalized view, which attempted through, through historicism to place all humans onto developmental stages could then be superimposed onto various peoples and regions throughout the world scientifically and so they did this categorization of mapping mapping evolutionary things on uh, evolutionary sensibilities onto the rest of the world or different regions um, and that was called science and that in the same way that we refer to science today 
So they thought that they were doing science. Science and Euro-Christianity here is very much blended. Um, the debates about evolution and Christian stuff is uh, a 20th century phenomenon I'm not going to go into today. Um, uh, implicitly, however, the persistence of the Euro-Christian worldview concerning Christendom uh, informed the civilizing desire and increasingly evolutionary trajectory. As Pagden summarizes, quote, in time, Indians and all other barbarians will become civilized beings, just as the Europeans climbed up from barbarous beginnings via Greece and Rome until finally they reached the condition of the Christian Homo Renatus, or the reborn human. Just think about uh, born again Christians, right? That's another articulation of this same concept, but it's earlier and it goes back all the way into um, uh, before the Reformation, before Protestantism. Uh, so this historical trajectory and quote evolution is put forth as an ascension, a rising up, a rebirth, thus civilization. And you see my hand making these gestures, right? The metaphor is always this up-down metaphor from the Euro-Christian worldview. Um, so civilization brings people up. Um, education brings people up. That's all part of this Euro-Christian worldview. Um, and um, it was implicitly, so it's implicitly Christian carrying with it its own pagan history from which it itself had risen. Um, and so that the sense is like, oh, look at all these pagan, these pagan Indians in the so-called new world. They're just like we were before we founded Rome or Greece. And so they're just from an earlier stage in history. And uh, um, we need to convert them and they'll come along. Or these Africans, they the, the same way with, the, with African slaves. This is what Euro-Christian um, supremacy does in its thought. Um, you have to see that it's part of the Christian element, not just part of racism or ethnocentrism. It's embedded in the theological view of how the world works. Um, this is the drama of sacrifice um, that is imposed onto um, the genocide of, in, of, that's imposed onto indigenous peoples and it results in genocide. So uh, I'm gonna come to the end here for today. Um, but if we look at these debates, and these debates are happening just before Shakespeare is born, um, 1550 to 51, these are the, the um, uh, Valladolid deba debates or the that city in Spain. Um, uh, uh, um, so Jeremy Schott, who's a historian, writes, the identification of indigenous peoples of the Americans as new Gentiles authorized the militant, often violent extirpation or genocide of traditional religions as idolatry. Certain colonists, such as Juan Guinness de Sepulveda, went so far as to deny that people's na natives possessed the capacity for natural religion at all. That's that argument that they're just like animals and they can be treated like beasts of burden. As such, they were subhuman and could be exploited as slaves. At the same time, however, others located the native cultures along the spectrum of civilization. That's the Bartolome de las Casas idea that, like, no, they have some capacity for reason like us, so they're human like us, but they're not as human as the Euro Christian concept of human. And so when we think about human rights and the loaded language around human, when you read even um, thought um, from African-American scholars or um, pan-African scholars in general, they will attack this notion of human, um, capital H human, as being a Eurocentric idea to begin with. And that's part of when I am reacting against universalist secular humanists and their readings of Shakespeare or their presentations of Shakespeare, their justifications for why we should teach Shakespeare, that is, um, uh, I'm, I'm attaching myself to these anti-colonial thinkers like Aimé Césaire and to a long history of anti-colonial thought um, that sees uh, the kind of power situation for what it is, which is one of domination and violence in the name of a Euro-Christian social movement. Uh, and so just, I said I would end um, 
uh, quickly, and, and I said earlier that I would refer to a way that this continues to inform us because I say that Euro-Christian colonialism is continuing to happen. Um, I've talked about the doctrine of discovery and papal bulls. Um, sometimes people want to say that the United States, for example, and the French Revolution, they created this break in time, created secular societies, separation of church and state, and yet early on the United States in a really important Supreme Court decision in 1823 called Johnson versus McIntosh embedded the United States rights to land and discovery within the doctrine of discovery, the Euro Christian doctrine of discovery. Um, so I'm going to quote that to end my intro to colonialism and the tempest, and then we'll get into the readings of the actual acts. So, um, this was at work, all of this language was at, was at work throughout the papal bulls from the 1450s and 40s into the 1490s after the so-called discovery of the New World and into the founding charters of New England. I'm not going to go over that, but if you want, I can send you the documentation where the language just gets pulled from the papal bulls to say, well, because we're Christians and they're not, that's why we can take their land. And then the ideas of race, because they're not white and they're not Christian, that's how we can see that they're not Christian enough and that then we can hold them into slavery for those um, uh, uh, reasons. That's at least what the Euro-Christians um, presented and embedded into their laws. Uh, so this was at work in New England before the founding of the United States, but in 1823, this is one of many passages from a long Supreme Court case. I'm going to read this one paragraph just to end things. Quote, the potentates of the old world found no difficulty in convincing themselves that they made ample compensation to the inhabitants of the new by bestowing on them civilization and Christianity in exchange for unlimited independence. That's funny, unlimited independence actually means slavery there, but um, uh, this was the idea. The idea was that like, well, we brought you Christianity, so you've got to work your way, you know, like in exchange for us because we brought you this great theology. <laughs> um, uh, so to return it, um, uh, they brought they were bestowing on them civilization and Christianity in exchange for unlimited independence. But as they were all in pursuit of nearly the same object, it was necessary. All of the Europeans were in the same pursuit of the same object, which was land, right? It was necessary in order to avoid conflicting settlements and consequent war with each other. Don't want the Christians fighting other Christians to establish a principle which all should acknowledge as the law by which the right of acquisition which they all asserted should be regulated as between themselves. This principle was that discovery, the word discovery, gave title to the government by whose subjects or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession." End quote. So the right for the United States government to have the land, to subject Native Americans to uh, reservation systems, to move them across the country, which is what started to follow after all of this, was because they inherited the titles of discovery and possessions to the lands that were went all the way back to the old world and the foundation by the popes. Now there's a lot more Christianity and language throughout, throughout that, so I've given you the link here as well. That doctrine of discovery and Johnson v. McIntosh continues to be cited in U.S. law, even by people like the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So everybody wants to say, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you're so great, all of this stuff, but she continues to cite uh, Euro-Christian doctrine of discovery in cases against Native Americans. That's what I mean by ongoing Euro-Christian colonization. And when we read back and look at Shakespeare, we can see the formulation of all of this at work. And that might be a better justification for continuing to read Shakespeare is that he gives us insight into Euro-Christianity as a social movement 
rather than the secularist universalizing humanist thing that says that he teaches us how to be good people because if good people is good people like Pro prospero in this book i'm not a good person at all <laughs> i'm more like caliban um uh thank you for listening and we will continue with act one and um another contextualized reading have a great day